Well, hello again, everyone. Welcome back. I had a great week. Did you have a great week? Okay, I don't have a lot of time because early release day from school and the kids are going to be home soon, so let's get right to it. I've got a whole bunch of children's books here, classic children's books, which are still decently popular. You've probably heard of some of them and read some of them. The others, maybe not so much. Everybody's different, right? I just wanted to highlight some of the ones that are not quite as well known as like, say, Heidi and The Secret Garden. So getting right to it, this is a decently popular series, still decently popular, but not quite as well known as it should be. And that's why I'm highlighting So You Want to Be a Wizard by Diane Duane. Now this is actually a series which, again, not as many people know. I didn't even realize it myself until I remembered this book existed and I hadn't read it but like once when I was a kid and I decided to share it with my youngest child so we read through it and I realized that hey there's a sequel there's a bunch of sequels we wound up getting all the books and reading them all the first one is still just exemplary it really is it's well written it's interesting it's yet another younger kids learning to be wizards story but there weren't as many out when this came about. It was the early 80s, I think. And for the time, I mean, one of the kids is Latino, Hispanic, at heritage. At, I'm sorry, I'm not sure of the correct term. I always get mixed up. Um, but yeah, for the time, I mean, th th that's a pretty big deal. That didn't always happen. Although I gotta say it happened a little more in the 80s than the 90s. Um, that's what, how I remember it. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Anyway, there is also actually a non-binary character, um, not a human, um, kind of a, a magical creature that does... Spoiler alert! Ah, darn, I didn't say spoiler alert. Sorry, there will be spoilers in this video. I always do this. Uh, this character does sacrifice itself for its friends in the end, so it's it's kind of going on ye old theme of LGBTQ plus characters sacrificing themselves for uh, the quote normies unquote. Um, however, again, for the time it was written, this is a pretty big deal and it's pretty progressive. I do suggest picking this one up and giving it a go. I don't think personally, I didn't like all the sequels as much. Um, the second one I really enjoyed, and I, I don't know, by the end of it, I was kind of like, I think I was disappointed in the ending of the entire series. But, you know, it, it certainly was interesting and different, went a lot of places I didn't expect. Next up, another popular kids series. And this one has been reissued. Um, my kids didn't read it, um, except by me introducing it to them, so I don't know for sure how popular it still is. I know they hadn't heard of it until I introduced it to them. And that series begins with Mrs. Piggle Wiggle. Now the thing about Mrs. Piggle Wiggle is I'm not sure how well these books have aged, um, simply because a lot of it centers around kids with behavioral issues. Um, they, they tend to be presented as issues that, you know, just everyday issues that kids, kids tend to have blown in, out of proportion. Uh, now, nowadays we have more diagnosed learning disabilities and whatnot and etc. And there are all sorts of uh, actual medical, you know, medical and therapeutic ways to um, deal with it. Is that the correct term? Um, just help people um, recognize it and um, make it part of their lives. And Mrs. Piggle Wiggle has these home remedies, a lot of which involve pills and very odd things. Um, so I'm just not sure how well that part of it is aged. What these do have is they're very well written, um, very cute parts, very funny parts, if you accept all that, um, all of what's going on with the medicines and cures and whatnot, and do these kids even need to be cured, etc., that type of thing. Um, but if you accept all that, they are cute, funny, as I said, well-written, and um, imaginative. Definitely imaginative. 
Next one up here, I'm going to scoot through uh, a couple that I've recommended in other videos. This is the 21 Balloons. Now, the 21 Balloons is, again, a very imaginative novel. Um, it can drag a little bit in places because it can seem a little bit dry and a little bit technical in explaining um, what's going on. So it might lose a younger child in certain places. I think that was kind of the flavor of the time influenced by Jules Verne. Honestly, I haven't read a Jules Verne novel yet because it always got a little dry for me. But The 21 Balloons is about a balloon fever when ballooning, balloonisting, no. um, going up in a hot air balloon, basically, when that was all the rage, and it's all the rage of everything in this novel. And there is a man who decides to take a balloon flight. It's a big deal. He goes out, he gets lost at sea. This is a historical fiction novel because it's centered around the big volcano blast that happened on Krakatoa. Now, I didn't know that was a real thing for years. I only read about it in the book. However, he winds up on the island of Krakatoa, finds it is inhabited by fellow white people uh, who are explorers and have decided to colonize this unpopulated island. Um, partly because they find out that there are diamond mines. <laughs> but this is not a book about colonialism because the, the island is unpopulated. Maybe they didn't have the right to live there. That's debatable. What is imaginative is that all these people are inventors and they invent just incredible contraptions. They each build a house where the architecture style is a different style and they take turns serving a meal to all the other families in the same style as their architecture. So like an Italian style architecture would be Italian food. So they do that, but they all also contribute with their different wacky and weird inventions. One of the things they have built is a large platform with balloons, and that is what they will use to survive should the island ever go up with the volcano is exactly what it does. And that is how our hero is able to escape the island and tell the tale. So really different, really weird, interesting little story. Okay, the other book that I have covered before is Caddy Woodlawn. Caddy Woodlawn, uh, to recap, is a pioneer girl novel in the spirit of Laura Ingalls Wilder, of course. However, um, Caddy is a little different. She has a large family with a decent amount of brothers, and she is raised more or less as one of the boys, um, but then she's also getting to the point where she kind of wants to um, learn, quote, girly, unquote, things as well. Caddy is very brave and very strong in different ways, and she is given, through her adventure, she is given different ways to show that. Including, there is a part where um, rumors are spreading among the white people that the Native Americans are going to go on the war path and everybody's afraid. So certain of the whites decide to, uh, to go on the offensive first. And Caddy hears about it and her father isn't around. Her father is also sympathetic to the Native Americans. Uh, so she goes on her own through the woods at night in order to warn the Native Americans. And she makes it and all is well, thankfully. Uh, but yes, again, a very brave little girl that has very interesting adventures. Okay, on to ones I have not covered in any other videos. This one was a big favorite of mine growing up. I know it was a big favorite of a lot of other people's too. This one is The Ordinary Princess. Honestly, I've never liked the cover picture. I like the pictures inside. This is a classic uh, retelling of like every princess story ever, particularly at, when it begins Sleeping Beauty. The princess is born and she's like, she's the seventh daughter. All her princess sisters are your typical uh, white girl, blonde, blue eyed, beautiful as the day is long, um, not super smart or talented, but they're princesses. That's you know, all they need to be. And she is looking like she's going to turn out the same way. However, 
Her fairy godmother shows up, takes one look, says, Ugh, no, not again. And she puts a spell on her that she will be resolutely ordinary. And so that's exactly what happens. Her princess name is Amethyst with a whole bunch of other names to be fancy, but nobody can manage to call her that. They all just call her Amy. And she turns out to have mousy hair, freckles, a little turned up nose. She's the most ordinary kid ever. She is sweet and kind and all this other stuff. She is not what one might call beautiful. She's not plain either. Somewhere in the middle, pretty, pretty darn ordinary. Now, they decide to marry her off, as one does with princesses. She gets wind of it, says, oh, heck no, no way. So she runs away, goes to a neighboring um, kingdom where nobody happens to know her, and gets a job as an assistant kitchen maid and starts earning money. And she finds out that uh, although it's hard work, she really prefers it to princessing. When she knows she happens to meet the prince, disguised more or less as an ordinary type of guy, they wind up falling in love, and at the end, they go off and live in a little hut in the woods together, just to live an ordinary life. This is a really sweet, really cute book. It still reads well, even as a grown-up. Next up, you will note that so far, these are all my copies, and um, of course, I have most of the books that I grew up with. I never got rid of them. And either that or I got them secondhand. So they are not in the best shape. Um, This one particularly, this is The Book of Dragons, uh, which it doesn't even have the spine. And I can only tell that by looking at the back. I got it this way. I have no idea what the cover looks like. I'm going to have to look it up here. The Book of Dragons is a collection of short stories by E. Nesbitt. Now, E. Nesbitt is a popular children's author, wrote Five Children and It and a few other things. I've never read anything else by them, actually, Um, but I really enjoy this one. These are presented as a series of fairy tales. Not, Not all fairy tales fairy tales. Some of them take place in modern times, but they all center around dragons. They are really fun and interesting. There's a modern one where dragons start coming back into the world having, having, after having been driven out. People start seeing dragons everywhere. They start out small and then get bigger and bigger and bigger and become a real nuisance, and they have to figure out how to get rid of them. There's one where a little boy is looking at a book. It's full of magic pictures uh, of animals, and the animals start to come out of the magic book, and he has to figure out how to get them back in. In. There are some that are more complicated than that. Um, those are more some of the more simple stories, but they're all very, very cool stories, especially when you're a kid. Okay, so next up, this is another really popular author who I haven't read anything else by. This is The Water Buffalo Children and the Dragonfish by Pearl S. Buck. These are two stories put together in one book. Now, Pearl S. Buck is known for The Good Earth, a novel set in China. She was a white woman who was raised in China for a great deal of the beginning of her life. So for the time, these were probably pretty accurate depictions, I'm guessing. I mean, not being a a native Chinese person, I couldn't say for sure. I will say that uh, from my limited perspective, these seem to be very good stories and um, very honest and decently accurate, as far as I can tell. Now in the Water Buffalo Children, there is a little white girl who is living in China and she meets two little Chinese children with their water buffalo. It's their job to take the buffalo to the water every day and back. So they all become friends. Now, the children and the water buffalo happen to appear out of the tall grass after the little girl had picked up a stone and rubbed it, and she thinks maybe it has magical powers. So this ends up being one of the uh, kind of games that they play, also kind of trying to figure stuff out about life and their surroundings. The dragonfish has another little transplanted white girl new to the area, And she encounters a little Chinese girl, and they become friends. Both of them have something in common. They have what they perceive as a difficult home life. They both have older brothers, and they 
feel that their older brothers get all the attention and all the care and nobody loves them. They find a, what appears to be a, so it's like a decent sized heavy figurine. They manage to carry it and they go to the nearest city. They decide to pawn the dragonfish and then use the money to get some food and find jobs and set up for themselves. Now the pawnbroker is a kindly older man and he can tell that these two girls have run away. So he's like, oh, you know, I can't take their stuff. What do I do? What do I do? So he lets them set up shop for him while he goes off to inquire whether anybody's missing two little girls and a dragonfish that might be valuable. Meanwhile, their dads are in fact worried about them because they do in fact love them. They decide to go to the city and see if anyone's seen their little girls. They manage to track them down. You know, all is restored and everything is better. They're very sweet, very good evocative stories. Next up is rather another well-known one and there's a reason for that. This is Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Now, especially among my generation, Nim is a well-known word because of the movie adaption of this book, The Secret of Nim. I remember very little about this movie except that I saw part of it at a friend's house and wouldn't you know it, it scared the bejeebers out of me because I was way too young to be watching something that scary. Thank you, Don Bluth, for all the 80s kid nightmares. However, the book is not scary particularly. It does have the constant threat of Nim, the science facility, uh, overshadowing everything. And Mrs. Frisbee does go on an, on an adventure of sorts. However, there is no magic involved. Unlike in the movie, it gets kind of supernatural, as I recall, which is odd when you have that in your head and then you go and read the book again. And you're like, hmm, uh, okay. Um, but yes, the book is very well written. So basically the crux of it is that Mrs. Frisbee must move her home. It is being threatened, but her youngest son has pneumonia and can't be moved. However, the rats of Nim, who have been experimented on, and um, this has given them, like, extra intelligence. They step in and help her. It's a very good book. So, next up is another still somewhat decently known series, um, but not, like, super popular. This one is The Moffats. I also have the sequel, The Middle Moffat. Um, there was another one, Rufus M., which I never wound up getting. I'm not sure if there were any others off the top of my head. The Moffats are, oh gosh, these are really cute stories. They're slice of life books. Uh, these are about a family living back at the turn of the last century, and I do mean the last century. Oh my gosh, it's so weird to say that. Uh, of the turn of the 1900s, not like the 2000s. So these are, it's a small family who lives in a small town. Their father has passed away and they're raised by their mama. And there are four children who she is raising as best she can. And the kids all pitch in as best they can when they can. And they have so many homegrown adventures. It's really, it's charming, is what it is. It's charming and sweet without being cloying. Yeah, really fun. Most of the adventures tend to center around Janie. Janie is the third born child, and she calls herself the middle one since she is one of the middle children. And her oldest sister is practically a grown up, so at least as far as she sees it. Janie is a very imaginative girl and she goes out and does lots of different things. One of the things that struck me is that she briefly joins a basketball team with older girls from the high school. I was reading something recently where they didn't have girls basketball teams for quite a long time. So I remembered reading this and I thought that was very odd. Like maybe they had, I don't know the history and I'm gonna have to look it up. Maybe they had them initially and then they kind of got pushed aside saying, oh no, no, you can't do that. And it took a while to get back to it. It's neat to read things like that and makes you wonder. Next up is another one by Eleanor Esty. She wrote quite a few things. And this one is my very well-read, falling apart copy of The Witch Family. Now, if you haven't read The Witch Family, absolutely read this one. This one has been, it's well read for a reason. This one has been a dear favorite of mine for years. 
It's about two little girls, two little regular human girls who one of them knows all about witches. The other one is kind of the hanger on and always wanting her to tell her stories. She likes to tell about old witch who was so bad that she was banished by the little girl herself. And the little girl, whose name is Amy, says that the old witch had to go and live in a house on the top of a great glass hill, never specified where, it's in imagination land. Now the thing is, the way the book is relayed, we see old witch on the top of glass, the glass hill and we read about her story and her adventures. And the line between reality and fiction is blurred, so we can't ever be exactly sure if the story is just something that Amy's telling, or if it's both the story that she's telling and something that's coming to life at the same time. Amy decides pretty quickly that the old witch is going to be lonely, so she decides to give her, first of all, she has a cat. All these things are going to help old witch learn to be good, be a better person. So she sends a little girl for her to raise. The little witch girl goes to witch school, and she winds up getting a cat of her own, and pretty soon there ends up coming a tiny baby witch and who has a tiny kitten, so it's getting pretty crowded up there in the glass hill. One day the little witch goes exploring around the glass hill. She flies around on her broom. She finds a hole in the hill, climbs in, and finds a lagoon with a little mermaid, and there's a little mermaid baby, so yes, there are quite a lot of characters here. It's, again, this one is a must read. It's very imaginative, very enjoyable. Next up, I misspoke. I think I already covered this one as well. This one is Understood Betsy. <laughs> another, oh my god, how is that cover even on there? <laughs> Understood Betsy is another, gosh, I've got a lot of books with little girls at the turn of the um, 20th century. It must have been a really popular thing. I, that was when American Girl came along. There was Samantha and, and all this, you know, there was a real historical interest at the time. I've got even more that I'm not covering in this video. Anyway, Understood Betsy is, uh, to recap, is about a little girl who is raised by her aunt and her aunt is very protective of her. She wants this little girl to always feel safe and the aunt herself is pretty scared of the world so she's not a very good role model always, you know, screaming whenever she sees a dog, uh, no matter what the dog is doing, for example. Now, it comes to a point where the aunt is unable to take care of the little girl anymore, so the little girl, Betsy, is sent off to live with some relatives who live in a rural area. So off goes this shaking, ten, you know, terrified little girl, and these relatives, shocking as it is, expect her to know how to do things for herself. So simply by virtue of them expecting this and her not wanting to disappoint them, she figures out how to do things. She learns throughout the book how to stand on her own two feet. And when her aunt comes back and is able to care for her again, she realizes that they both realize that they're not suited to each other anymore, that they still love each other. But it's better for Betsy to stay where she is now because she has grown and changed into a different person. It is a great story of learning how to be independent and figuring out that you can do things for yourself. I think that is a very important lesson in life. Coming into the home stretch, speaking of stories about little girls at the turn of the 20th century, I have there, well, there's a whole series of it, but I only have the first one. This one is All of a Kind Family. Again, this is part of a series. I have read the other books, but not in a long time. I'm mostly sticking to this first one. This is a story about a decently large family, a mother, a father, and their five little girls. This is a Jewish family, so I got to learn something by reading it about um, some Jewish traditions, not being Jewish myself. So that was very interesting and informative. They live in New York City, and they, you know, explore the neighborhood, and it's Again, this is a real slice of life, but it's, it's different from the Moffats because they don't live in a small town. They live in a big, busy city, and they go to the market, and they go to the library and meet the nice librarian lady. There is the oldest girl. She's 12, so she's, you know, on the cusp of growing up. She has her first crush on an older male friend of the family, 
uh, who has his own sadness because his fiance and he split up. And there's a great mystery about that because he doesn't like to talk about it. Well, at the end, it turns out that the librarian, of course, in this huge city, there are only so many people, uh, I guess, but it turns out the librarian is that fiance and she's been missing him and they get back together. So very sweet. And the girls in inadvertently facilitated this and there's great rejoicing. But anyway, the girls themselves, they have very simple adventures, kind of like the Moffats. Um, the, there's a whole chapter about cleaning and how their mom gets them to do it. Um, but I don't know. I like books like that. Next up, I have one that I rediscovered uh, because I read it at one point when I was a kid, forgot about it, came back to it when I was a grown up, when I remembered it existed. This is Tom's Midnight Garden. Tom's Midnight Garden is a time travel story. It is about a young man, the Tom of the title, who goes to live in a big old house in the city. It is boring. It, you, it used to be a house house, now it's got like apartments. And he has nothing to do. He is sick and there to recuperate. He ends up lying awake a lot at night and here's the grandfather clock down in the hallway ticking. One night, he hears the clock chime 13. So he goes downstairs to investigate to see if something's wrong with the clock. What he finds there is that the entire hallway has changed. The entire house has changed. He finds that he can leave the house as well and walk around the grounds, and grounds it does have. It has an incredible garden outside that he can explore. Now first he doesn't see anybody else. Then he finds that he can come here on successive nights, and he does see people, but he can't seem to interact with them, so he thinks he's like a ghost. Eventually he finds a little girl about his own age, and that he can interact with her. So he comes a couple times, they meet each other and play. However, on successive visits, he finds that every time he visits, she is a little bit older. So he is time traveling, but he is traveling to different points in time and he cannot control it. Eventually, the little girl grows up and ages away from him. Now at the end of it, giant spoiler alert, and I thought this was very good and very effective. I did not see it coming. At the very end, uh, the cranky old lady who owns the house invites him up and he thinks maybe I've done something wrong. She invites him into her apartment. He goes in and realizes this is the little girl. It was her house the whole time and it still is. She still lives there. And somehow or another, he was able to go back into her past. And she said, I've been waiting all these years to see you again. What a great, great twist. What a great story concept. Oh my gosh. Next up is a book I do not in fact have. I've never gotten around to getting it, but I do want to recommend it. This book is Homer Price by Robert McCloskey. Robert McCloskey has written a lot of books for kids, a lot of picture books like Make Way for Ducklings, so he's pretty well known. Homer Price is not high up on the list for some reason, maybe because it's more of a book book, um, but it's very cute. Again, Slice a small town Americana life. And it centers around a little boy named Homer Price. And I'll admit I don't remember a lot off the top of my head about this book. I did reread it a few years back and I was thoroughly charmed, so I wanted to put it on the list. There are some hijinks, including one involving a donut machine. I remember that particularly. So it is recommended. I think I will go and reread it to refamiliarize myself with it, and I recommend you do the same. Now, next up is a decently popular series. Again, it is a series. I have one of the books, but I'm not putting it here because it is not the first book. I don't know why I don't have the first book. I like the book I have. Anyway, this series is The Borrowers by Mary Norton. Now, I mentioned this specifically, even though I thought it was a decently popular series, but not everyone seems to be aware of that. There was an anime a few years back, The Secret World of Arietti, and a lot of people know that and reference that and don't seem to be aware that it's based on a book series. There was also a 90s adaption, I believe, of The Borrowers, um, which I never saw. It looked like another one of those movies that was basically an adaption of Home Alone, you know, like, oh, here's this bully and we're going to play all these tricks on him to take him down and I uh, got a little sick of those. 
except for Mouse Hunt. That one pulls it off. Oh my gosh, I will do a, another movie video including Mouse Hunt. Oh my gosh, I've got to. I've got to. Love that movie. Okay, so one book that I did not read as a child. I saw someone recommend this recently. I thought, oh, I better check that out. So I got it. I read it to uh, my youngest child and loved it. It's, it's really interesting and unusual. And possibly that's because it is Momo by Michael Ende? 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 I don't know how to pronounce his name, the author of The NeverEnding Story. Oddly enough, I haven't read The NeverEnding Story. I've only seen the movie, and I understand the book is quite different, so that might be worth a check out as well. Momo is another story involving time travel. Momo's a little girl who shows up in this small town. Nobody quite knows where she comes from, and that question is never answered. She's a very normal little girl for the most part, except that she's ex an extremely good listener, which is touted as being like a superpower, practically. She's able to make so many friends and bring people together when they have differences simply by listening to them and letting them pour out their troubles. Now, one day, the town starts being, um, not invaded, I don't know, uh, these men in gray start showing up. They're void of pretty much personality. And what they do is they offer people the chance to bank their time, their personal time, so that people can save time in order to do the things they really want to do, whatever that may be. Now, the fact is that a lot of people are in fact doing a lot of things they already want to do and don't realize it. They are enjoying their time and finding it relaxing in many ways. Now, when people start saving time, doing things to save time specifically, they find that their time is in fact taken away from them. The men in gray sort of disappear into the ether and people forget they ever existed and they can't figure out where their time is going, but they can't seem to do anything about it and the, and the problem gets worse and worse. Now, the children aren't affected. However, the grown-ups uh, start going, hey, we've got all these kids hanging around and we're too busy to take care of them, so we got to put them in special centers and in special schools and that takes care of the kids and gets them out of the way. Momo does not have a home, and she doesn't have anyone to take care of her. She has very good friends, but they are all taken away in one way or another by the men in gray. They attempt to affect her, but are unable to by any sort of regular means. She ends up going on an adventure to try to get time back for everyone, to get them back pretty much to how they were and to defeat the men in gray. And that involves basically meeting the master of all time. And um, of course, he cannot fix it. She, being human, has to involve herself in the human world and sort of be a go-between. And of course, she manages it in the end, but it's very close. It's a very exciting little adventure and a very different, unusual sort of story. Last up is another series that I never got around to getting my local library had so many editions in this series that I just read them and enjoyed them. And of course, it was harder to get books back in the day. Uh, you can find these books now, but they are hard to find because they are unfortunately out of print. And I am so anxious to find out who else remembers this series. It was a kid's detective series. There were so many of those when I was a kid. Again, those were very popular. This series is The McGurk Mysteries by E.W. Hildick. McGurk and his friends decide to start a detective agency, and they each have their disparate personalities, which help to contribute in different ways. They each have their strengths and their weaknesses. For example, McGurk is a good leader, but he has a very quick temper, so the others kind of have to tamp him down from time to time. I don't remember all the details, unfortunately. It's been so long since I was able to read this, but I remember enjoying so many of the books and seeking them out. So this is one I would really love for them to bring back. I don't, as far as I know, they haven't yet. So again, they're out of print. If you can track one down and read it, it it's it, they're so cute. I, they are kids' mysteries. They're not complicated, not difficult. Um, you'll probably figure it out pretty quickly, or you'll go, how on 
earth would that even happen? It doesn't matter. It's, it's a kid's mystery and it's fun. So these are very good recommended books for your kids. So that about wraps it up for now, if only because those are the only ones I could think of in the space of about a half an hour when I plan this video. So <laughs> I really need to get the hang of planning videos. In that spirit, I would like to know what lesser known children's classics or just children's books in general you have to recommend. And have you read any of these? And what did you think of them? What did you think of them as a kid and then rereading them as an adult? Uh, just put them in the comments. I would love to know. So I'm off to uh, try to actually plan my videos ahead. <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, well, you'll find out next week and so will I. Uh, uh, hopefully I'll find out sooner. Uh, anyway, I will see you then. Bye!